I don't know about you, but I, far too often in my life, I've been kept up by my, oh, yeah, children, you can go. <laughs> Speaking of my failures and frustrations, um, but yeah, far too often in my life, I, I've been kept up by my own failures, my own frustrations, my own inability to, to walk out the Christian life. That my, the vision of myself as the, the noble Christian gets eroded by a constant battering of failure and ineptitude and weakness. For some, this feeling is the reason that they leave the faith altogether. To escape, to find freedom from that like a constant sense of the accusing finger of God over their life that once again they did not measure up. This internal cacophony of his gavel striking once again that his standard was not met by your standard. And in the midst of such frustrations, I don't know if you share them with me, uh, it, it's easy to, to take a step back and wonder about this Christian life if it's meant to be easy or to be hard, or at least this hard. And we hear the answer of Jesus, which is not necessarily the answer that we want, whether it's to be easy or hard, and he says yes. In the one moment he says, come, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And the next he says, he warns off potential followers saying, hey, before you do this, before you decide to follow me, count the cost. You don't want to be like someone who begins a building project and doesn't have enough money to finish it. And rather than building a tower, you build a monument to your own foolishness. And what does that cost us, he say? To die daily. To in light of your love for him, to hate your family, your mother, your wives, your spouses, your children. It's a heavy cost. And rightly, we have hucksters and swindlers who enter the Christian sphere, garbed with theological arguments who try to soften the words of Jesus to, to make them seem lighter than they are. We have prosperity preachers who proclaim to you that if you just have enough faith, life will go well. You'll be absolved of, of struggle and hardship. You'll be wealthy and healthy and wise. We have progressive Christians who, who proclaim, don't worry about sin or any of those things. God doesn't really care about those things. Just be nice. Just have a, a general feeling of niceness towards those around you. And, you know, God will be fine with that. Or others who, who when, you're, when you're struggling with your, your own ineptitude to live up to the Christian standard, just say, listen, any thoughts of that is just is meandering towards a works righteousness approach. Brush it aside with your appeals to the finished work of Christ. And for the astute readers of the Gospels, of Jesus, the words of Jesus and of his apostles, we know that none of these answers really come close to what we find in the Scriptures, do they? We, unless we desire to be deluded, we know that these are just false presentations of what the Scriptures tell us. Yet in the midst of what the Scriptures do proclaim, the necessity of holiness, the necessity of righteousness, the necessity of following God and our own frustrations and failures in order to do so, we are not called to live in despair, but in rejoicing. That from beginning to end, in our failures, in our successes, in the entire path of our Christian life, what we find is the grace of God, and we rejoice in that. And if you would, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15. And if you've been attending our Wednesday night Bible study, you've probably already heard Pastor Sean go into these, some of these points with much more detail and much more clarity than, than I will be. So if you want to tune out and just find his Bible study, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> but we hear in John chapter 15 the, the last of Jesus' I am statements in the gospel. And here, starting at verse 1, he says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. 
He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. He prunes the branches that do produce fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by my message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be, produce, be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything that you want and it will be granted. And when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. And this brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey the Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. As, as Jesus is proclaiming uh, the last of his I end statements, he starts off with this idea, uh, well, uh, perhaps a startling statement I am the true vine. And I'm sure that most of you, if, when you read that, if you don't already know the answer, your first thought is, well, what's the false vine? What's the not true vine? But if you're a good reader of the Old Testament, and I perhaps spend more, more time in there than I ought to, um, you realize that the vine is consistently used as a symbol for God's people, a symbol for Israel. That, and when Christ says that he is the true vine or the true grapevine, what he's saying is, I am the true Israel. We see hints at this in, say, Isaiah chapter 5. Right? When, he sa- when he says, I, the prophet says, verse 1, I will sing the song for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a rich and fertile hill. He plowed the land and cleared its stones, and he planted it with the best vines. In the middle, he built a watchtower and ca- carved a wine press in the nearby rocks, right? That God plants a vineyard, and he does everything he, he can to make it succeed. He gives it protection. He gives it nourishment. He, he does everything that the vineyard would need, but then, bottom of verse 2, he waited for a harvest of sweet grapes. But the grapes that grew were bitter. Skip down to verse 7. The nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of heaven's armies. The people of Judah are his pleasant garden. He expected a crop of justice and he found oppression. He expected to find righteousness. But instead he heard cries of violence. Right? That this re- repeated motif throughout the Old Testament of you know, the vine or, or the vineyard and that God is waiting and expecting and doing all that he can to produce good fruit, to produce good wine. But repeatedly, again and again and again, what he finds among the people is not the fruit of righteousness and justice and holiness. No, what he finds is oppression idolatry, uh, and a, a people who are hardened to do their own thing, to go their own way. We see this again in Jeremiah chapter 2. He says, yeah, I planted you, the people of Israel, a choice vine, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild one, right? Uh, that, you know, the wild vine, wild grapes that are bitter and sour and don't have the, the, the sweetness that we associate with grapes, right? That in each time throughout the, the scriptures, as, as the people of Israel are called the vine, at each time they are met with disappointment or God is, it finds disappointment in how they live, in the fruit that's produced. Despite all that he does for it, ultimately they leave the person, they leave God wanting. They do not represent him rightly to the world. They do not show the world what he is like. 
And the Lord, looking for the fruit among his people, his people Israel, is disappointed again and again and again. And so as Jesus comes on the scene and he says, I am the true vine, he's saying, I am the true Israel. I am the true people of God. And so in the midst of our you know, frustrations and failures, in this, because Christ is the vine, we rejoice in the Father's provision. That God has provided for us his Son to be the true people that we could not be. And when Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches, is it, what do you see? is that you, in being connected to him by faith, are also part of the true people of God. That if you remain in him, you, are, you receive what is his. You receive his identity. He, the true vine, the true people of God, the one who does the will of the Father, who shows the world what he is like, that you are part of that by faith in him by remaining in him. Now, there are some today, and you know, perhaps you know, semi, semi-celebratorious pastors and clergy people who will assure you that Jesus is not the only way. We heard a little bit about this last week. right? That you know, God's love for all people, God's love for, for you know, everybody, it, he, he wouldn't restrict his people to just those who follow Jesus. He wouldn't, he, you know, the, whatever your beliefs are, you know, you be a nice person, you do, you do nice things, and, you know, God's going to be okay with you. And it's not hard to find people like that who proclaim that with articulateness and winsomeness and, uh, well, seeming intelligence that can produce what may seem like on the surface a, a, a pretty nice argument. And they may go even further and say that if you believe that, you know, that Jesus is the only way to God, that Jesus is the only way that you can be in right relationship with God, well, that's just, that's just arrogance. But what does Jesus say? We may think that it's arrogant to, to accept, you know, Christ and say that he is the only way. But there's nothing arrogant about accepting one thing as true and the opposite thing as falsehood. For the person himself is saying that it's not true that Jesus is the only way and what is true. But what is arrogant is that when we hear the word of God, when we hear the words of Christ regarding himself and saying, no, I know better. I know the real story. I know what Jesus says is true or what the gospel writers say Jesus said is true, but really, I know what God is really like. And that is the height of arrogance. And when Jesus says that I am the true vine, he's saying to be truly God's people means being connected to him and through him. And we, yes, we affirm God's love for all people and his desire for all people to become his people, but this happens through the vine. We rejoice in the Father's provision of the Son that all people can become his people. That the Father reveals his love for us no matter what station of life or ethnicity, or class, in that he provided for us the means to become his people. That what we could not be, through him we are. The faithful covenant people. Moreover, yes, since Jesus is the vine, we can rejoice in the Father's provision, but since Jesus is the vine, we can also rejoice in the Father's production. What does Jesus go on to say? Let's read verse 5 and 6 again. Yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. 
that anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like useless branch and withers, and such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. And Jesus, so when Jesus is talking about, you know, who he is as the vine and who his disciples are as the branches, what, the thing that, that makes the branches branches is this, that they produce fruit through him. And what is the fruit? Well, it's, it's hard to, to nail it down. It seems like that when Jesus is talking about the fruit, he's talking about the, the whole gamut of a life in God. The holiness and righteousness and, and love for neighbor and connection to the very life of God. That all of this is the, the fruit of one connected to the branch. And he, and he makes this great promise, a great promise to his people. That if you remain in him, you will produce fruit. And how different is this than what we've seen in the past? As the, the prophet Isaiah writes, you know, uh, of you know, the people he's writing to, he says, even your works of righteousness are as filthy rags to the Lord. That you think that you're doing some great things, but, but the Lord sees these, and he says, you know, they, they're like dung-filled rags. They don't come near what the Lord requires or what the Lord desires. But Jesus is saying to his people, it's not that way with you. That God, through the Son, produces fruit that brings delight, that brings satisfaction. That the Lord is looking to produce in his people those connected to the vine, well, what they could not do. So not only are you what you were not, but you can do what you could not. You can please God in connection to the, in connection to the vine. That the whole life of Christ is dispersed through the branches. Now, when we eat, you know, our body very naturally breaks down all you know, the substances, the, the, you know, the proteins, the carbohydrates, the fats, all the vitamins, and nourishes our bodies. For some, there's been too much nourishment. <laughs> but you know, as we consume these things, where we don't necessarily, you know, we're not necessarily thinking about, you know, I need to break down, I need to convert you know, these carbohydrates into energy so that I can go out and, and do things. No, no, the, the body naturally does it. And we receive the energy whether we're thinking about it or not, whether we're, you know, focused on the, the, the nourishment of the food or don't pay a second attention, we just ate it because it tasted good. Yet, at this, yet we find that our bodies are nourished and energized and receive the substance, you know, this, uh, you know the, all that, without us ever having to think about it. What we need to do is just choose to eat. A pretty easy choice to make. When those who are connected to the vine, they, we naturally receive the nourishment from the vine. The invitation to the, the wholeness of the life of God in us through the Son. That he mediates to us all that God desires, all that God requires, all that's going to bring God glory and joy is mediated to us through the Son. That my job is not to, to muster up the willpower to do the will of God. My job is not to, to say, all right, now I'm going to do this stuff. Now, we can't reject doing the stuff. We can't say, oh, I, I, you know, I know what God says, but I'm just going to do my own thing anyway. But if we want to succeed in the Christian life, we're not looking to, oh, I just need to, if once I get enough willpower, I'm finally going to be able to do it. No, it's, I need to connect myself to Jesus. I need to let him nourish me. That when we sin, when we blow it, or when the, the, the full extent of our sinfulness is revealed to us, 
oftentimes what we want to do is we want to run and hide like Adam and Eve in the garden. We don't want to be in the presence of God, do we? We want to to escape his gaze, get our life together, you know, clothe ourselves so we're not in such shambles, and then come before him and say, hey, you know, we can just forget about that last little bit. But Jesus is saying, no, no, no. In your life where you are, you are, if you want to, to find the nourishment and the life of God, it, it only comes through connection to him. That in our sin, it must drive us to Jesus by faith and repentance. If we want to, to be able to produce the things that God has called us to produce, if we want to be the people that God has called us to be, if we want to do the things that God has called us to do, it's going to come through Jesus and not once I finally buckle down, I'm going to get, get my life in order. And for many of us, we, we spend our lives saying, well, oh, I'm just going to, you know, God's finally going to be pleased with me because I'm finally going to, you know, kick the bad habit, do the right thing, and then I'm finally going to find the smile of God. And we're going to run into frustration after frustration after frustration because we're not connecting ourselves to the vine who gives us his life. Now, since Jesus is the vine, we talked about, you know, we can rejoice in God's providence in giving us the one who we could not be, giving us the true Israel to whom to connect. Since Jesus is the vine, we can rejoice in, in the Father's uh, production and that we can be able to have transformed lives and to do the things that we could not do. And all of this is confirmed and mediated by one more thing that we can rejoice in. With Christ as the vine, we can rejoice in the Father's pruning. What does he say? Right at the beginning. I am the true grapevine. Verse 1. My Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. Do you notice what Jesus is saying here? that all those in him receive the blade of God over their life. That no one remains unscathed. No one remains uncut. No one remains comfortable to grow as they see fit and to mature as they see fit. No, every single one connected to the vine receives the, very, the blade of God over our lives. We suffer. We're cut. We bleed. And yet, the pruning hand of God is to cause us to rejoice, to find comfort in. Why? Because it shows us, it, reveals, it confirms to us the first two points. That the pruning hand of God reveals that I'm still connected to the vine. That I'm still his. Because God doesn't prune off Branches that are already cut off. That when I experience the pruning hand of God, it affirms to me that you are still part of the vine. And moreover, the pruning hand of God confirms that God is not done with me either. That he's wanting to produce that harvest of righteousness in my life. He's wanting to cut off that which is dead He's wanting to cut off that which uh, will prevent my life from, from flourishing. And so Jesus tell, you know, tells us in verse 11, right, I'm telling you these things that you'll be full of joy. That as you go, undergo hardships and difficulties and frustrations, that you find in that joy because you know that the Father is not doing these things without a purpose. That within these things, that God is doing something in your life in order to produce fruit. And this is one of the most constant themes that you find throughout the New Testament. To those undergoing hardships and trials and difficulties, that they are called to find joy in it because we serve a God who uses all of these things, don't we? And so James reminds his readers, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for what? Great joy. 
For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Right? James writing to the church, often suffering, and he's saying, you're going through trials. Have joy in this. Not because it's not hard. Not because it's not difficult. But because in these the work of God is being accomplished in your life. Paul, similarly, he says, chapter 5 of Romans, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help to develop endurance. And, de- and endurance develops strength of character, and character de- strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit, to fill our hearts with love. Peter, likewise, 1 Peter 1, in this you rejoice, though now for, now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right? That the whole, the whole New Testament, it's like every single author says, you know, as you suffer, as you go through hardships, as you find difficulties, find this as an opportunity for great joy. Because in these, God is at work. The pruning hand of God that cuts you and slices you and hurts you is not doing it without a purpose. He's doing it to produce fruit. And he will cut off Anything, whether it's dead and wicked and sin sucking the life and right, or if it's just something that's there that may be perfectly fine, but yet it's going to inhibit the production of fruit in your life. Have you experienced the pruning hand of God? Have you felt his blade? My family and I have been in a process of being pruned by the Lord. Of him cutting off things that have given us great comfort and great joy. That have revealed to us again and again his his grace and his love to us. And yet, find that the Lord is cutting them away. For several months... The Lord has been um, putting on my heart that my time at this church is coming to an end. And as I shared this with Liz several months ago, and we both kind of had the the same reaction is, well, I don't want to. This place has been too sweet. And yet, In that, the Lord has made it abundantly clear to us that he's calling us to go. In this past week, I I accepted a a position for for church in Pennsylvania to, to become their senior pastor. And we don't have all the details nailed down, but at some point during this summer, um, we'll be transitioning out. But this church has been a near and dear place to to us. It's the only church my children have ever known. A church in which two of them have have found Jesus, have been baptized in, who have been loved by the kids' own staff and and ministry team, who have been loved by the other children here and their parents, and have found the the grace and the mercy of, of Christ demonstrated to them very, very well. It's a place where Liz and myself have been welcomed and received with all of our own faults and foibles and failures. And again and again, having our hearts warmed by your care and generosity. It's a place where I've gotten a chance to to work with some uh, incredible people people who I've gotten to know very dearly who aren't just putting on a show on Sunday mornings but live out the gospel in their day-to-day life 
whose wisdom has di- helped direct me, whose care has encouraged me, whose accountability has, has helped me walk more holy in the way of Jesus Christ. This is a special place. And you're a special people. And for many times in our lives, we don't necessarily know that we are in the good old days until we've left them. But that's not true for us. We know exactly what we're leaving. We know exactly what's being cut from us. We feel the sting of the Father's pruning hand over our lives. But we look forward. Because we know that the the Father doesn't do this for no reason. He's producing a harvest of righteousness. He's pruning off what he needs to in order to produce fruit for us and for you. This is a place where we would not leave on our own initiative. You're a people that we would want to hold on to forever. But beloved, don't resent the pruning hand of God over your life. Don't resent being cut with the blade that affirms that you are indeed his children, that you are connected to the vine, that you are being, that you are being molded and shaped to produce the harvest of righteousness that brings the Father great glory. Don't resent as you feel the steel wielded by the Father's hand because he's he's coming to you with pruning shears and not a chainsaw. Give joy or rejoice in the Father's will and work over your life no matter how deeply he cuts you. And even if he slays you, follow. That the Father, in his goodness and in his grace, that he has provided all that we need to be his people. He produces in his people all that he desires, all that he requires. And yes, he prunes his people deeply. But in all these things, we can trust him, can't we? In all these things that we can move forward in joy and and rejoicing. That we see the work of God mediated through the Son in our life. And as his people, we rejoice. Just call Jeff and the worship team up. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would do as I cannot do. That no amount of eloquence or pleading, or study can produce in your people what only you can produce. Father, I thank you for this people whom you have already produced a great harvest through, that I have been a beneficiary of. But Father, as we we go forward into life's difficulties, into our own failures. Lord, we ask that you would keep us part of the vine. That your entire life would fill us and nourish us and produce in us all that you desire. We are looking to your son and him alone, Lord. That what we cannot do by our own willpower, that you provide. So come, Lord, glorify yourself among your people, we pray, in the wonderful In the powerful name of Jesus, amen.